on here yeah. and okay. what you want to accomplish out of the taping. So if he's okay, uh, I don't have a good shot of you. That don't, that doesn't don't, matter. No problem. You'll save film and uh, plenty of television sets in the future that will happen. The, uh, okay. My idea for, uh, for this project was uh, based on a number, there's two or three different factors. One, I have a master's from the University of Oklahoma. There's a couple of folks there that are just, out, just really outstanding folks. But we just read, and all we would do is hear stories, you know, somewhere out there are, are folks like uh, Dr. Gagne and Dr. Dick and, and all these great folks at Florida State. We just, I mean, just... Uh, you know all the work that's been done, and, and uh, you know just what a tremendous location for thought in our field. And but we didn't have access to any of those people to, to see them. Uh, we just had we could just read some of the material that was going on. Well, with that experience in mind, you know uh, when I wanted to do doctoral work, this was the only place I came for this particular reason. It's the best place in the world. I didn't even apply anywhere else. I'm coming here specifically for that reason. Now, when I was at seminary, I had a, um, I took a class in ethics, and one of the famous ethicists of the world was a man named T.B. Maston, who uh, was just a, a visionary as far as race relations and a number of different things. I mean, this was in the 50s when he was talking about treating people and treating women right, and, and especially in a real conservative, uh, you know, in a theological setting and, and that whole issue. Uh, you know, he was just ostracized for, you know, how can you have these ideas, you know? And now we look at him as being a genius. Well, I got to see a video of him, and it meant so much because he would tell stories about those days and what it was like. What was it like to live in 1950, and what were the conditions like at that time? It helped me understand the particular dilemma, why this was an issue, and um, to help me. Uh, when I went to AECT this last year, one of the keynote the, one of the keynote people was a lady named Dr. Jennifer James, who is a cultural anthropologist, mm -hmm. and she talked about the importance that you know for our field that we have stories that we need to tell and how powerful our stories are, and that we need to that we've got to share and pass our stories on, and of course that really touched something with me because I'm a huge. Garrison Keillor fan, mm -hmm. so the, the power of listening to the Prairie Home Companion and the stories. You know, and, and all those things together connected with, um, and I was thinking, you know, sitting there in, at a AECT, you know, listen, we have the technology to do, to do this today. Maybe we didn't 35 years ago. Why don't we capture some of our resources, what I call our instructional systems treasures in our field? Let's capture these folks, get some idea of where they've been, the process, how they've come here, their journeys that they've gone on, so that students at the University of Oklahoma 10 years from now will have the opportunity to not only read about them, but, be, but have an, at least an opportunity to see them. And so, so this led to the, this, well, let's take a look and see if we can do this. And uh, it's been something that has, uh, th that's why we're here today, is to, uh, to do that. So. Um, my, uh, the goal is to talk about the past, the present, and the future, and, and to apply it very practically. You have uh, a lot of wisdom for graduate students, not only today, but graduate students in the future. Some things that you've seen as a, pro as a professor and a practitioner in the field, that if we're going to go into academia or if we're going to go into business, there are some things that you would recommend that we need to do, and I think that those are some important things. Um, so uh, I guess just since, um, tell us a few mm -hmm. things as, uh, as graduate, what would you say to graduate students to, uh, to encourage them, things that they might need to, to know? Well, each graduate student needs to know something different. And so there's no standard advice. You know, good advice to one person is not good advice to somebody else. And, um, but I, th I really think that two ends of the continuum. One, you have to decide what you stand for, what you put, you know, where you'll put your uh, feet in the ground and say, this is what I believe in, this is, this is where I stand morally and ethically. And then you say, 
On the other hand, I have to be flexible because we're in a profession that responds to a world that's changing very rapidly and I cannot be dogmatic. I have to use my knowledge and experience and apply it in an ever-changing environment. And so it's, it's a mix of those two, the flexibility and, but knowing the things you're not gonna be flexible on. And, but you know, the other kinds of advice of like, uh, work hard, there's somebody else sitting over here who say, hey, you better relax a little bit and uh, make sure you get to know people. Well, on the other hand, somebody else, you know, stop interacting with people and sit down and think for a while. So, you know, it, it depends on where you are in your career, what your career goals are. You know, advice is going to differ. What, uh, what advice did you, as a, when you were a graduate student, uh, what, uh, what types of uh, advice that uh, really stuck with you that you got from some of your uh, people you worked for and some of your mentors? And tell us a little bit about that. Well, my graduate training really began as an undergraduate. Uh, I was an undergraduate at Princeton, and they require you to do a to major in your junior year and work on a research project. And I got ass and everyone's assigned to a faculty member, so I got assigned to a uh, a man who I tried to contact three or four times, but he was like faculty, very very busy man, uh, particularly when it came to a uh, underclassman. So um, I went to the, the head advisor and I said, I can't get in to see this guy. I, don't, you know, I may never get any advisement here. <laughs> and uh, he said, what are you interested in? And I said, well, I'm really interested in Skinnerian psychology and programmed instruction. And he said, oh, he said, we got a new faculty member this year. His name's Bob Gagnier. He doesn't have very many students. Why don't you go down to the end of the hall and talk to him? So I went down and kind of presented myself to this man whom I knew absolutely nothing about other than he might be somebody who talked to me. And uh, so he said, sit down, let's chat. And so we, <laughs> we just started chatting and one thing led to another and I got a job in his research lab and he uh, really helped me more by example than, you know, than any great profound statements. He worked hard, he was very, very bright um, and was challenging the status quo. And so uh, he gave me as much of his time as he could, but when he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be an educational administrator. You could hear the O, oh, you know, <laughs> three blocks away. Well, you know, sorry, if you want to throw your life away, I guess I... <laughs> Uh, and actually I applied to and got admitted to a graduate program in administration, but uh, by the... Stop. Stop. I've got to readjust something. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. the way it is. I didn't see something happening until it happened. <laughs> Not going to catch on fire. I'm concerned about that. These halogen Those lights. halogen lights. Okay, we'll go, we'll come back to that. Or, um, well, then uh, you were telling us a little bit about your um, yeah your experience and uh, beginning to work with with your uh, mentor. And tell right. Tell us a little bit about working with your working with your mentor. Okay, my mentor was Robert Gagné at Princeton University, and it was. I came by that almost by accident because the person I was assigned to was unavailable and so they, uh, based on my interest in program instruction and Skinnerian psychology, uh, the chief advisor said, why don't you go see Dr. Gagné and talk to him? And so I did and it was extremely fortunate because I got to work in his lab for two years and conduct research and probably more importantly watch him in operation. I remember one thing he was doing, he was editing a book at that time, and, and that advice to me was never, ever edit a book. You know, it's so, <laughs> so much more difficult, it's so much easier just to write your book, but trying to coordinate people who were always late in submitting things, and he, that just drove him crazy. So um, I, I saw him conduct research and uh, his commitment to the, to the field, and at that time he was 
clearly a psychologist, a learning psychologist with background in military psychology. And, um, but in the light of all that, I had decided I wanted to be an educational administrator, and uh, which discouraged him greatly. But he helped me out, and I got admitted to an a, uh, uh, ed administration graduate program and was all set to go to that program until about March or April, my senior year, and I finished up the research project, which I was doing, and I decided, this is what I really want to do. This is it. And so I went and repented before <laughs> Dr. Genye, and I said, you were right. I made a mistake. Uh, what can I do about it? So he said, well, where do you want to study? I said, well, I, I really would like to study at the University of Pittsburgh because you know that's where Bob Glazer is, and I think a lot of interesting work is going on at the Learning Research and Development Center that Glazer established. So Gagne contacted him, and at that point they didn't have any money left for assistantships. And so uh, he said, well, where else would you like to go? And, I, and all I could think of was I lived in western Pennsylvania, and I didn't want to get too far away from home. And so I said, well, Penn State. Of course, I know absolutely nothing about Penn State. And so he called up, and the psych department there, that morning somebody had turned down a public health service fellowship, which was very lucrative. And the, based on Gagne's uh, credentials, uh, the guy at Penn State said, well, yes, we happen to have a fellowship. Would you like to come? I said, I'll come. So I went, and I was in the psychology department, um, which was dominated by clinicians and r Wisconsin rat runners. And I was there interested in human learning. I got my master's there. They split the psychology department, which was in education. They moved it over to arts and sciences. And they said, now anybody who would like to stay in education in an educational psychology program can stay. And I was the only one to put their hand up. You know, 150 <laughs> students. Oh, I thought maybe they know something I don't know. <laughs> so I went into, uh, I stayed in the College of Education and eventually became the first grad educational psychology graduate from Penn State. The, uh, the good news and the bad news was I was the only student they had for the first year, and I was one of six or seven the second year. So I, you know, I really didn't take many classes. Uh, I just kind of worked on projects and, and uh, chatted with people. Uh, Bob Lathrop, whom some of you may know is the dean here at Florida State, was my major professor there at Penn State. And um, so uh, my, gr my graduate study was a lonely existence. Uh, I, had a, I did a lot of computer programming, and I ha had a little company that I ran, and I worked in a research lab. And a Occasionally, I read the literature, and uh, but I was getting my degree in educational psychology, and that's important uh, because I was interested in human learning, and their thing was measurement and evaluation. Um, and so, when I graduated, the the kinds of jobs that were available were: you want to go out and teach four or five or six sections of Ed Psych to uh, teacher education students. Or do you want to run a scoring machine? They had just come out with these Digitex electronic scoring machines. And, uh, and I did computer programming to analyze the data, and so people wanted to hire me to run their scoring machines. And I thought, what a terrible existence that would be. And here my buddies were in town at Penn State. They graduated. They just went down to the road and were working for a little company called HRB Singer. And they were doing military contracting. This was an electronics R&D firm. They, they uh, invented infrared radar. But they had psychologists on hand. And the psychologists were getting contracts to do program instruction and even computer-assisted instruction at the time. I thought, you know, that's what I really want to do. And, but it was heresy to get a degree in, from a place like Penn State and then go into business and industry. I mean, that was. I mean, I really was tense when I told them that was what I was going to do. You know, it's, um, it's like you were marrying the wrong person, and, and you know, you have to go tell the family. Uh, but 
I went there and it was a great experience. So I'm, I'm, your original question was, what was my graduate training like? My graduate training really started as an undergraduate in terms of setting my values and standards. And then I had this, in retrospect, pretty peculiar graduate experience in the psychology department and, the, and then the uh, uh, ed psych department. And my degree was in ed psych then going to HRB Singer. And that was kind of like a postgraduate experience because I learned there how to write proposals and how to interact with people in government agencies and how to deliver products on time and under budget and all those wonderful things that uh, people seem to value and which I dislike pretty intensely. And uh, so I, at that point, I was, uh, I was ready to move. I, I spent uh, almost two years there with Singer, but it was it was very valuable because I got another piece of my training was that industrial base uh, that I could use, and uh, that's when I then came to Florida State. So Florida State was the first school that you had an academic position. On. Tell yes. Tell us a little bit about uh, the when your experience at Florida State, which has been a few years. The. Um, the opportunity to come to Florida State resulted from my having met uh, a man out in California who was graduating from Stanford, and he worked with Pat Soupies and was into computer-based instruction, computer-assisted instruction. And he was uh, looking around the country for just the right position. And he was interviewed a number of places and uh, apparently, in his mind, had settled on Florida State as the place that was up and coming, had the resources, had the commitment, were really going to do something. So he called me, you know, it was one of those things, right time sort of things, said, how would you, would you be interested at all in going to Florida State University? And I said, I've never heard of Florida State <laughs> University. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, he said, I've been there, I'm really impressed uh, with uh, their commitment. Why don't you go down and interview? So my wife and I flew down and we interviewed for three days in Tallahassee in the mid-60s uh, and came away saying, we don't, we just don't know. But at that point, I, I figured the best thing to do was to get a job in academia for a couple of years, then go back north and uh, get a real job somewhere in a, in a real university. And, uh, and, and I'm being terribly honest, that was really <laughs> what I thought. <laughs> and so I came here and I thought, I, I need to get the credentials, I need to get the experience, still kind of extension of my training. And so we got here and there was a computer assistant instruction center, for those of you who know, down at the basement of Tully Gymnasium. So we'd go in at 8 o'clock in the morning, come out at 6 o'clock at night, and never knew what happened in the world <laughs> outside because we were in inside with no windows, uh, but uh, we had contracts with IBM and had uh, eventually got an IBM 1500 system with uh, 25 or 30 terminals on it. Most important thing as far as Florida State was concerned was we also got from the U.S. Office of Education a training grant. And I can remember when we were writing the proposal and Duncan my partner said, well, how many students do you think we ought to request? And I said, I think we can handle four students very nicely. We can have some one-on-ones and we can be exploring the literature and conducting research. And he said, no, the government says we take 20 or we don't take any at all. I said, gee, 20, okay. So we went out and beat the bushes to find people who would say, that they were at least interested in computer assisted instruction and come in and so we started uh, de generating courses and with with uh, neat titles like the uh, how, to, how to develop programmed instruction, how to develop computer assisted instruction, uh, I don't know, technology in the classroom. And Duncan could j just weave these uh, course titles out of whole cloth anytime. And uh, so that was the mode we were in. We were uh, struggling to raise money, struggling to do projects, str 
struggling to attract graduate students and offer courses and have a, uh, an environment that was uh, good for graduate students. And at that time, our um, dean of the College of Education retired. The, dean, the head of the Department of Educational Research, we were offering these courses in the Department of Educational Research. And so people were in there taking statistics, measurement, evaluation, measurement, and then they would take umpteen courses with us as kind of a, uh, almost like a certificate. And, uh, but their degree was in educational research. But the department head there also stepped down and they did a, a real search and came up with Bob Morgan, who was another time, one of those right time, right place. He had been in industry. He had been in government in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. Office of Education, large program management, had really gotten to know the people in the field. Uh, he and his family wanted to move out of the D.C. area and so he came down, but when he came, he got a major commitment for positions that he could fill. And so uh, he came in and essentially decided, and I'm trying to say this as nicely as I can, decided that all the resources coming to the department for the next five years were going to go into instructional design and the people who had been there weren't going to starve to death, but they weren't, weren't going to get any more resources. And that was pretty well understood, if not appreciated, by some of the faculty. But his first um, recruit was Bob Gagné. And so Bob and I kind of came full circle. And at that time, Gagné had gone from Princeton to the American Institutes for Research in Pittsburgh to Berkeley. And in 1968, Berkeley was not a pleasant place to be. And Gagné uh, was not very, uh, he, he wasn't wearing sandals and a uh, <laughs> robe and, and uh, uh, hanging out on Haight Street or whatever. Uh, he, you know, uh, he, he was very serious about his profession and I think felt that his profession was being interfered with in that environment. And so Bob Morgan, with all his charm, uh, convinced Gagné that this was the place to come. And Bob came, and that just kind of opened the floodgate, because very quickly then Les Briggs, whom fewer of us knew, but who was an outstanding consultant and had not been an academic, he'd been a consultant and had worked in the military on R&D projects in the area of educational technology and very, very consistent with Gagné and his views of learning theory. Uh, he came in and committed the rest of his career to being an academic and learning how to be a good academic. And he, uh, the two of them then were joined in 1970 by Bob Branson, who had been colleagues in a number of different locations with Bob Morgan. and. Uh, Branson came in and took over the leadership of the Center for Educational Technology. And um, at, at that point, just to kind of, from 66 uh, is when I came, 68 was when Morgan came, and from 68 to 73, we continued to uh, teach our own courses in the Department of Educational Research and attract students through funding of research uh, assistant, graduate assistantships. And it was, in terms of program development, it would be, well, Bob Gagné, what do, you, what do you like to teach? And Bob said, well, I like to teach learning theory. Okay, we'll put that on the schedule. You're teaching learning theory. And that's how we built our curriculum. Uh, and uh, we, as we added faculty, that was kind of the mode because you are not hired for what you teach. Uh, as one of our colleagues would say, you can teach anything. You were hired because of what your special research interest and expertise was. So uh, we continued in that mode till 73 when there was a major reorganization in the College of Education. And as part of that reorganization, the dean saw fit to split instructional design and development out from the Ed Research Department 
And so we became a standalone program, and we convinced the Board of Regents that we had been a standalone program for quite some time, and we ought to be given degree granting status, kind of grandfathered in. And uh, that did indeed happen. And so all of a sudden, here were these people who had, we had really been uh, very uh, independent in terms of seeking our, our own way in the world. Uh, Morgan essentially said, we're going to have a program here now. We're going to have a master's degree, we're going to have a doctoral degree. And we are going to, you know, systematically go about designing a program. And he appointed, in his wisdom, uh, Gagné and Briggs as the co-chairs of that committee. And that was one of the most uh, uh, in inspiring, um, standard-setting experiences I ever had. Because one would sit at one end of the table, one at the other end. And everybody came prepared, because you knew Gagné was prepared, and you knew Briggs was prepared, and you didn't want to look like you weren't prepared. And we tried as best we could with the technology we had at that time, methodology, to really look out and say, where are our graduates going in whatever this thing is that we're calling instructional design and development, where are they going to go? And we picked such fields as we knew that the publishing industry were just going to scoop up every person we could produce. To my knowledge, in 32 years, we've had one person go with a publishing company. No. <laughs> so, more <laughs> predictive. <laughs> uh, we're really good at those. Um, but anyway, we thought people were going to go into R&D centers. We thought some would go into university teaching. Uh, we thought some would go into military R&D centers, which were very well funded at that time. And uh, we did, in fact, try to identify competencies. And the documentation goes way back to the mid-70s, which we then aligned with courses. We created a few new courses because we didn't have them, uh, uh, everything covered, and began offering uh, courses and degrees. Now, the interesting thing is that we really were uh, primarily interested in the doctoral program because that we knew what to do with a doctoral graduate. Uh, we knew kind of how to place them, uh, where we, we thought we could have opportunities for them to be employed. We really didn't know what to do with a master's graduate. And a master's student was only someone who was on their way to getting a doctorate. And so we w didn't have the focus on the uh, master's program that you would find today. Uh, we continued um, kind of operating this way. Uh, for a number of years, and just to wrap this up, Anderson Consulting about 1980, or Arthur Anderson, kind of created a job called an instructional designer. And they started coming in and interviewing people, and hiring them, and paying them money with a master's degree. And we're saying, what's going on here? <laughs> well, hey, you're supposed to be a doctoral student. You can't go out there in the real world and earn money. And uh, that really, was a watershed time for our program because it wasn't too long before two-thirds of our students, our graduates, were master students and maybe one-third were doctoral. And at that point, now we started getting doctoral students saying, I'd like to go into business and industry. I think I can uh, be more comfortable. I can play a role there. I don't want to teach. And uh, that coincided with a period in time when there just weren't any academic positions opening up. And so people were forced into business and industry. And so we've kind of continued on from there. But that that's kind of uh, my recollections. We added people uh, in the 70s, uh, Bob Reeser and Walt Wager, and 1980 with uh, Marcy Driscoll. They were, a number of faculty came in to serve in a faculty development center, which was part of Bob Morgan's uh, enterprise at one point, where, where faculty were hired to work with other faculty members to improve their instruction. And that was for the way Bob Reeser was hired, Al Oosterhoff. Um, those are the two that come to mind immediately. Um, Walt Wager actually was hired into higher education. 
and we wanted somebody who and we desperately were seeking someone who knew about media and technology because none of us did we all came out of psychology we felt that we should have somebody with that credentials but we also wanted somebody who could talk systems and we kept saying you know if we could just get a guy like Walt Wager down there in higher education that came from Indiana he that's the kind of guy we want well we went through I think two searches and finally you know we went uh, <laughs> why don't we just get Walt so we went downstairs and, and hired Walt and uh, so he's been at Florida State longer than he's been in the program by two or three years. Um, so those those were the way the and 75 also was the time when Morgan got another uh, full professorship and saw the the wisdom of getting somebody who was in the front end analysis business and that's when he went and hired Kaufman. And Kaufman had been at a university in California and done a lot of consulting and I, he'll have to speak for himself, but I think he saw the value of coming and, and joining a team uh, such as we had. You've, you've mentioned uh, uh, about uh, talking about systems and uh, in our programs, uh, instructional systems, and you've really seen that grow from, from its infancy to where it is now. Uh, what does instructional systems mean to you today? And talk a little bit about the, the development of instructional systems. Okay. Well, you notice when I was describing our program, we were originally called Instructional Design Development. And we were very comfortable with that because most of us, as I said at the time, were psychologists interested in applied human learning. And we were doing it in the context of uh, developing processes and using technology. Some of the faculty became uncomfortable with that, that that was too narrow a definition of what we were doing, and that we were not just designing self-instructional modules for a half an hour, an hour of instruction. We weren't writing textbooks. We were designing total learning systems or instructional systems. Uh, uh, and it didn't take long to convince the rest of the faculty and so it was about 1977 or 78 we changed the name to instructional systems when you say what does that term mean uh, instruction if, if it's instructional systems in a sense that's an that's a noun and so it's a it's a set of components and procedures which have a you know a um, deliberate purpose of, of, of uh, providing people with skills and knowledge and attitudes and that was what we were trying to do was to look at, a, at, at those components in a systematic fashion how do you get them to work together in order to produce the outcomes you want when you talk about instructional systems design then you get into the methodology and the, and the process that you use to produce that and uh, uh, course there are many many ways of doing that and uh, that's what we've tried to convey you're uh, you're very well known for a book uh, the, the dick and carry model of instructional design uh, how did that how did that come about how um, <laughs> I said that when as a graduate student I was very interested in programs direction program learning read everything Skinner and his students wrote I never had a class on it. I mean, I didn't have class on much of anything. <laughs> Some of you might say, well, that figures. Uh, but uh, we, didn't, we certainly didn't have classes like that. When we got here to Florida State, uh, my colleagues said, well, how about teaching that class on programmed instruction? And I said, sure, I'm really interested. I don't know how, to, I don't know how you teach other people to do it, but let's, uh, uh, let's give it a try. And so what I, what I did is I looked in the literature, there was no real models in the sense that we talk about models today. And so, and nor was there any textbook that said how to develop 
program instruction. So what I did was uh, collect readings. And uh, for example, Bob Glazer had written about criterion reference testing. Mager had written his book about objectives in 62. Uh, Kronbach and Scriven had talked about formative evaluation. So I just kind of put these things together into a course. And it so happened we were doing research at the time on computer managed instruction. And so what I created a course that was self-directed in the sense that you would read these readings and then go to the computer and take a test over the readings. And if you passed the test, then you worked on that. You know, if you were reading about Mager's objectives, then if you passed the test, then you go back and write some objectives. And then you could take them either to me or a graduate student kind of for review and approval. And, and so that was, that was my role in graduate, then my graduate assistant's role was to do that. And we ran that course for four or five years and it worked, it worked satisfactorily. People learned. I don't think people really liked it. But at that time, we were just doing feasibility studies. Can people learn that way? Uh, but in about 73, we, our uh, R&D center was closed. And uh, all these research on computer system instruction was moved to a large mainframe. And there was lots of downtime. Students were starting in a test, and then it would go down and come back up and say, "Welcome to test number three and you know, and they were starting all over again, and it, it just became very punitive for students. So I said, uh, "I'm not going to do this anymore." But I, so I went back to uh, create a kind of a traditional classroom environment where I would lecture on these topics, and students would do the readings and do the project and uh, I had one student who was particularly outspoken kind of person, meaning relatively uninhibited. And, uh, and we still get students like that. <laughs> um, and uh, about two-thirds of the way, three-quarters of the way through the course, uh, she came in and said, Dr. Dick, said, I really think we should stop using these readings. You should just write a book on instructional design. I said, well, that's very interesting, very interesting thought. And she said, yes, and I'll help you write that book. I said, oh, you will? <laughs> she says, yeah, I will. And I think we ought to start right away. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, let me think about it. And so I did, the, and she was critiquing the situation where, you know, and you've had this as students yourselves, where you have a reading where you have to read 20 pages, but there's really only three paragraphs that really have the message in there that you want, but somebody says you have to read all 20 pages, and that, that was true of our situation, of course. So we said, okay, uh, let's do it. And uh, that was Lou Carey, who is a female, and... Um, we worked on that project for a couple of years. And uh, the, by that time, the original question was, how did, how did we come up with the model? By that time, I had realized that to help students uh, understand the flow of the course, it helped to put these kind of boxes and point to this box and that box and that box. And it, you know, the model just I, I know that I read other things. I was telling somebody the other day, I know Bob Glazer had a model somewhere that said objectives, instruction, evaluation, and a feedback arrow. I can't find the article, but I, I'm sh sure I read that. I'm sure it, it influenced me. Other people were writing in the late 60s and 70s about models. And as a matter of fact, in terms of publications, Branson's model was published in 75. Ours wasn't published till I think, 77 or 78. But uh, I have a paper that I gave in the College of Education seminar of some sort in 1968 where I kind of had a version of the model that I was using. Uh, but it was one of those mother of necessity things. I j it just had to have something communicated to people what the process was. And by the way, as we went through the offering of this course, program instruction uh, lost its currency and we got into modular instruction and self-instructional systems of the 70s. And so 
Well, I said, we're not doing program instruction anymore. We're doing modular instruction. This is that flexibility thing that you got to have. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's where we went into the uh, just short learning units uh, using system. Well, and at that point, the influences were clearly Gagné's conditions of learning uh, in his events of instruction. We took those and didn't disguise them at all. Just said, if you want to have an effective instructional strategy, here's the things you do before the instruction, here's what you do during, here's what you do afterwards, and uh, used his events of instruction. We, uh, we depended heavily on his conditions of learning for differentiating between different kinds of learning outcomes and strategy, you, strategies you would use with them. Um, I was most impressed with the whole formative evaluation, summative evaluation discussions that took place in the mid-60s in which the government had invested so much money in curricula that weren't working. And they said, why weren't they working? I mean, why didn't we know that before they were so widely distributed? And the interesting thing is that uh, Kronbach really came up with the concept and, and, and uh, but not really the methodology. So people were saying, yes, formative evaluation sounds like a good idea. Let's, let's evaluate our products before we put them out there, but how do you do that? Well, the people who had been doing that were the programmed instruction people because the Skinnerians had started with a theory that said if you break in, uh, content down to these little small pieces and get people to respond continuously like the rats pushing the levers and the boxes, at the end of the instruction they will have perfect comprehension. And they would put together their program instruction units, and at the end, they'd give them a post-test. They didn't have perfect comprehension. They'd say, what happened? Why? What went wrong? So they started studying error rates. And where in the instruction did the students make mistakes? What kind of mistakes did they make? How did they relate to uh, other frames in the instruction? So that's what I was most interested in the late 60s was taking that methodology from the Skinnerians and applying it to the broader context text of, uh, of instructional systems design, and that's where we came up with the one-to-ones and the small group and field trial evaluations. So there was, the 60s were a dramatic time in terms of new ideas from Megger's objectives uh, through all of Gagné's work and, and the uh, evaluation. Uh, and then, you know, over here on the side were the computers churning away and a lot of funding in military research and development. Um, so, uh, your, uh, your model has, uh, you've really tried to integrate new ideas and new thinking into your uh, editions of the Dick and Carey book. Um, what would you say is the biggest change in your thinking from the first edition of your book to your current one right now? Biggest change is in box number one. Box number one in the first model was, um, I think it was called Identify Goal. I think that was always said in there. And when we did that first model, we really thought that the people who would be using the model would be going into public education. Because we, the business and industry mindset had not set in yet. So these, when I thought, when I was teaching, I was teaching people who would be using content which had been established by a group of social studies experts or historians or something would say, these are the goals the students should be achieving. Now, you instructional designers take that goal and design the instruction which will allow them to achieve that. And um, so we were wrong on a lot of fronts. First of all, you know, primarily the users have not been public educators, but rather people in everything else but public education. And secondly, the uh, I guess I've become extremely uh, concerned about how we identify that goal, and and realizing if you don't have the right goal statement for the right people, all the instructions wasted, and. Uh, this really came home to me when I spent a sabbatical year at Motorola in uh, 1989, 1990. 
and here you're working in an environment with experienced instructional designers working in a major um, electronics firm where everything is down the road they, they've everything's got to be uh, ahead you can't be looking back and their what they emphasized was if their designers you know if you tell me that you want people to be able to do X that's a piece of cake. I mean, we're experienced designers. We can train them. What we have to figure out is where X came from. I mean, do we really want to know X, or is, should it be Y, or should it be Z, or whose version of X should we be using? For instance, some example in the area of quality, they had five different gurus running around Motorola, and they're, now they're trying to create one system to teach quality. How do you work in that? And it was it was the identification of the skills and, and knowledge and attitudes that should be taught in, to any particular group at any particular time that became so critical. And uh, the methodology for doing that uh, was, you know, I didn't know what it was, but I was really pleased at the time because I knew that one of the last things the faculty had done before I went off on my sabbatical was a curriculum review. And one of the things that came out of that curriculum review was a statement by the faculty to Drs. Branson and Kaufman that the faculty would like to see established a, a basic course on needs assessment. And that each of them, Kaufman teaching his version of needs assessment and Branson teaching a course called performance systems analysis which focused on large systems. The faculty valued those courses. They didn't want those courses to go away. They weren't saying change those courses. They're saying that there's a level before that where people uh, should be learning the tools and the techniques and the broader picture, meaning some of Allison Rossett's uh, things. This was before performance technology came along, by the way, uh, in any broad scale. So when I went to Motorola, I was totally convinced the faculty was right on. That's what we should be doing. We should get our students in a course like that. And I came back, and I was all excited, and I went to Branson, and I said, uh, how's that course coming? And he said, it isn't. He said, Kaufman and I met for about 10 minutes. We talked about the need as expressed by the faculty. We agree 100%, and we also agreed that neither one of us wanted to do it. <laughs> and I... <laughs> I said, well, would you mind if I took a crack at it? Oh, no, VR, yes, you know, that. <laughs> this, the, it's the spirit of anybody can teach anything kind of thing. So uh, kind of naively, I said, oh, I, I really want to do that. And particularly at that time, uh, Allison Ross's book was kind of the coin of the realm, and uh, people, optimals and actuals, and people were talking about it, uh, along with Roger Kaufman's work. And so... That has been um, um, a great deal of fun for me in developing in that course and see it emerging and seeing the value that it has for some students. You've, uh, uh, yeah, I just had a quick question. You mentioned that a lot of our graduate students are going out into business and industry. Um, I was wondering if you give some suggestions as, I guess, uh, a graduate student who learned the model in an academic setting goes out and tries to apply these principles in um, a business setting and there's obviously, obviously financial constraints. Um, things don't always go the way I guess it went when you took the course and when you learned it. So I guess do you have some suggestions how you can make that academic to business transition so such that the power of the model can still be fully realized in, in the business setting? Yeah, that's, that's a good question because we occasionally get feedback from people in business who say you're producing stu students with rigor mortis. They come out here and they say, Dr. Dick said you've got to do step one, and then you've got to do step two, and you know you cannot do step four before you do step three. You know? And that is not the spirit in which, uh, it's not the spirit in which the model will get used. It's not the spirit in which uh, you'll be able to operate effectively in that environment. It goes back to the, the, the idea of being flexible and what you'll do and what you won't do. For example, I will not take a project unless they will guarantee there'll be formative evaluation taken on. And that's just a stand I'll take, and if they say, yes, we'll do that, fine, I'll get involved. If they say no, I'd say, I'm sorry, I, I won't do that. 
so that's pretty inflexible. On the other hand, uh, we know from the research, we know from just talking with people, that there isn't one model, there isn't the Dick and Carey model, that almost every group has its own adaptation based on the culture, the background, experience, the needs, the resources in that organization. And they have a, a methodology, most of, many of which are very loosely stated, they depend much more on your expertise coming in than saying, here's a picture and here's exactly the way we do it and we want you to do it exactly this way. Because they're going to be more interested in the results of what you do than how you do it. And so I, I think you take what you know from here as guidelines and use the experience you had and you know, how you work with an SME or how you work with a client or uh, what, what, you know, if I just can't get the objectives out of this person, how about if I talk to them about how they might assess whether somebody was doing this right or not and then I'll infer some objectives backwards and, and be flexible in using the model. Look at the models they have. They, their model may be better than the model that you have. And uh, I think, you know, that would be the strongest thing I could say is to, is to be flexible but it doesn't mean, you know, just, well, anything goes, you know, because it doesn't. And you just have to decide for yourself. Uh, but, but I think that the biggest criticism we get as, as academics, as professors who are responsible for people going out, is the uh, people being just too rigid about how you do it. So. You've, uh, you've shared with us uh, your journey and your pilgrimage at times, and surely you've got a couple of stories uh, through your uh, experiences that you'd like to share with us, uh, some, in some uh, interesting anecdotes. Well, you know, when you, when you think about that, and you think quickly back, and if I ask you all the same thing, um, what stands out is not things that are so funny as things that are highly emotionally charged. I mean, those are the things that kind of grab you. To see Bob Gagne go into a tirade is like nothing you've ever seen before. I mean, <laughs> when he is angry, he is really angry. And he, interestingly, does not get angry at people. He gets angry at things like machines <laughs> or processes or something like that, but it's, he, he very seldom ever attacks anybody, or I, I don't think I ever saw him attack anybody. It's, he'll, he'll say, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard, and anybody who, who adheres to that is an <laughs> idiot, but, uh, <laughs> but you don't take that personally, you know, of course, you know. But uh, no, there are, you know, the experience of of having to participate in the firing of a faculty member. The experience of sitting in a conference room with five or six colleagues who are just angry and would like to string you up because of what they perceive as you're having gone behind their back and done some things. Um, those th those uh, kind of things, getting, getting in an argument with the dean over what he said, she said kind of uh, things. Uh, th those are things that really stick out in your mind. Now, you, there are nice things. I mean, the award ceremonies like we had the other night are always you know, wonderful affairs for the students, uh, students and the faculty because they uh, are a way of expressing our appreciation. And, and um, you know, getting a car, every once in a while you get a card from somebody who says, thank you very much, I really liked what you did or what you said. And those little things are, are you know, you, you can't put a price on those. But the, uh, the humorous story, you know, academia is not that humorous <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> now, I, it, I, I guess the most fun that I have had in academia has been the last couple of years when I did the, uh, the uh, Follies presentation for AECT. And uh, maybe in your video clip at this point you want to insert this because we have it on video. But it's, uh, I did a whole routine. I, I always wanted to do something like this because uh, it, it was just one of those unfulfilled desires. And, and so I did about a 12-minute routine 
Seinfeld type routine with just a microphone, about a thousand people, and standing up there uh, relating stories. And essentially my story was uh, how I had conned Bob Reeser into allowing me to perform at this, uh, how I tricked him into it, and uh, it, was, it was just a lot of fun to do. And uh, then we followed that up about nine months later, so we had a retirement dinner for Reeser. And Marcy and I kind of emceed it, and eat, and we got three or four people to get up there and give a little tribute to Bob, and, you know, and what he meant to the department, and how much he appreciated. And my um, my my presentation had to do with how much he had influenced me, particularly as I went into this phased retirement and was going into looking for another career. And then I had studied Bob over the years, interacted with him so much, and admired him so much that I had decided that in my in the future I was going to become a Jewish comedian. Yeah. That, that was my, my, my thing. And then we did clips of him, his humor, that, which of course didn't work at all, but I was, <laughs> I, was, I was trying to mimic his approach. And those kinds of things have been very fun. And, um, but uh, I think maybe the, the, the thing that most distinguishes Florida State from that point of view is the collegial relationships that exist in the institution and the uh, among the faculty that we've been talking about. And it would be very easy because of uh, our interests um, to, to go very much our separate ways and not necessarily be willing to cooperate, support, and endorse each other. But the whole time I've been here, and I really think this goes back to Bob Gagné sitting at the head of that table and saying, this is the way you do things professionally. Uh, we have supported each other always. And uh, we, uh, I think we not only just like each other, we respect each other's work. And that's been just wonderful to work in an environment like that. You've, uh, over the years, you've seen numerous students come and go, are there any particular students that might uh, that kind of stick out in your mind? Uh, oh, we can't name names <laughs> here. <laughs> no, they, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's like anything else in life. It takes all kinds, and you get uh, very bright students. You get ones that aren't as bright but have other um, uh, endearing characteristics, and uh, that. Now, what is really tough, though, is when you see somebody that's been out for a while and you say, now, when did you graduate? Was it 93? Well, no, it was 83. <laughs> you know, you, you, those sorts of things that uh, are a little embarrassing because you kind of lose track. And you try and think of who were they there with at the same time and try and get those kinds of things. But. Uh, um, it's, I guess it's, it, it's amazing how much students will do, can do on their own without, you know, you'd like as a faculty member to think, gee, I have to provide all this support, but in fact, you don't. If, you know, Harvard learned this a long time ago, just select the right students and stand back and let them go.
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And also, so I'm going to be leaving. Well, you can ask another the guy who's going to replace sure, him. Sure. Sure. Whatever you think. How it goes. Okay. All right. Okay. okay roll in here. Okay. Roll over there, stuff. Yeah. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the process uh, for the benefit of graduate students. The process that you go through in writing articles and in writing your book. What? Well, there are really there are many models, but at least two fundamental ones. One is the team-based writing project, where you uh, function as a team and people have different assignments in terms of actually conducting the study and analyzing the data and writing it up. And there, um, um, you go to usually to people's strengths in terms of what they do best, uh, just as in any other team. And uh, I really enjoy that. I've done uh, a number of research projects with Bob Reeser and grad students, and the, the give and take on the design and the methodology and why are we doing that and why don't we do it this way um, is much more stimulating than sitting in your office by yourself and you know, looking at the ceiling and trying to come up with things. Um, I guess my advice there would be to get involved as many of those as you possibly can within the time constraints you have. Don't worry about authorship, ownership. That will come. Get the experience and think that it's well earned. And um, uh, so that's one model. The other model is one that Bob Gagné set for us in terms of, of uh, writing. Uh, if it hadn't been for Gagné, I don't think we would have written all the books we did at Florida State. I mean, it just kind of said, well, Gagné write books, writes books. I guess we all ought to be writing books. So what are we going to write about? It was, it, and it wasn't that, quite that simple-minded. But um, you do find that Florida State faculty have published a lot more books. And I think that, again, it goes back to Bob and his productivity. The way I write books I would not recommend to other people. Uh, it was, uh, the Dick and Carey book was written, uh, uh, I, we identified what the chapters were going to be because we built them around the model. So obviously the chapter identification was pretty easy. Uh, I said I'm going to have one page outline for each chapter. No more, no less. And so I had, uh, and I wrote that fairly quickly. And then I sat down with a tape recorder and just dictated it, the whole thing, in about a week, in you know, off time. And uh, got, we got that transcribed, and then Lou's job on the first draft was to d build the examples and practice sections. And so she wrote those sections, and then we got it all together, and we started to edit. And uh, we edited it to the point that we had a pretty good draft. Uh, we tried out with one class, did revisions, then we did a very formal formative evaluation process where for each class session we would have three students picked out uh, as our formative evaluation one-to-one -one candidates. Now we violated our own methodology by having all three of them at the same time, but they would come in and we would ask them questions and probe and give them tests and do everything just before the whole class. Then the cl whole class would come in and we'd go over the same topic with the, with the class. And we did that kind of formative evaluation. We had a very good editor who helped us with the book. We had it nicely formatted. And we reached the point where we said, this is ready to go to press. This is it. It's ready. The world will probably just overwhelm us with uh, offers for this. To make a very long story short, we went to 26 publishers, and uh, finally, uh, an editor from Scott Forsman in Chicago said, I think changes in teacher education are such that if we're going to field-based, performance-based teacher education, this is something they need to know. They're going to have to be able to do this. I want to publish this as an undergraduate textbook from teacher education. Well, Lou and I looked at each other and we said, <laughs> You know, you, you may think that that's what this is, but actually this is a book for a profession called instructional design. They're going to be instructional designers. They, are going, they may work in the schools, but this is a professional book. 
He said, well, I think you're wrong. But so we're going to publish his undergraduate book. So they essentially published it. Uh, and it, it was never marketed. Nobody has ever figured out how to market the book. And we're now getting ready for the fifth edition. And they, they st it's all word of mouth. You know, I used that book, so I'm going to have to teach class, so I'll use, you know, I had it as a student, so I used it as an instructor sort of thing. Um, but that was, that was the way the book got started. And uh, Reeser and I have a book that uh, I didn't dictate. By that time, the technology had become the computer. And uh, so I think in terms of advice, I would say, don't worry at the beginning about how it looks, how it feels, how it tastes. How, just get it down there. You know, get your fingers going. Get something in there. And uh, then let's look at it and see what you got. If you have a, just a reasonable kind of outline to start from, a reasonable concept of what you're trying to do. Uh, but don't try to edit every sentence as you write them. Flail and just get it in there and uh, then, then edit from there. That's been, always been the method I've used. The other thing that I do and highly recommend is that when I have to write anything or have to make a speech of some sort, um, I go out running. And I, I replay that in my head over and over again and uh, try to remember. Now, the problem is you don't have your pencil and pad out there with you to write these things down. But uh, I would say I have written the majority of what I've done the last 20 years has been done first while I've been out running, and then I come back in and capture it. Uh, three decades ago, you came to FSU and initially worked in the Computer Assisted Instruction Center. And so you started with mainframes and punch cards, and eventually uh, monochrome terminals. Mm -hmm. And now we've got networked multimedia screaming microcomputers. Do you think that CAI has lived up to its promise that you saw 30 plus years ago? And are the uh, changes in the computers leading to changes in uh, the foundations of CAI design? Or are they just new, higher standards for hygiene factors? <laughs> the computers today have capabilities that we would have you know, killed for. I mean, we, when we wanted to put in a graphic of Iggy, who was a little science ed figure going across the screen, you would have to plot every point of Iggy walking and when we turned on as part of a test one day we we got people to set at all 30 of our terminals at one time and turn on Iggy and see what would happen to Iggy and the system just died <laughs> you know, and so to say that the graphics were, were primitive is an understatement secondly we desperately as empirical scientists in quotes we really wanted to collect data we spent a quarter of a million dollars uh, trying to come up with a data gathering and data analysis system that we could get from people operating at terminals. You might have students at four or five different courses at the same time responding in different places in the courses. And in those days, whenever you made a response, it was written on tape. And so you have a linear tape that has this student's response and this one and this one from different courses and different places. And what we wanted to do was capture that and use that for formative evaluation purposes and research purposes. We never, uh, we never really were successful at that. I mean, it's such a complicated process. And we had a couple really bright guys that worked on it. And it never worked very well. Today. If you are seriously data oriented, if you come at it from a, an a educational psychology or learning psychologist point of view and want to use a computer as a data gathering mechanism, it's incredible what you can get. You know, we thought it was wonderful when we get response times, you know, how long it take the person to respond, but the things that you could do now. 
But what I see is much less data gathering. I mean, the uh, authoring systems never talk about their data gathering capabilities. People don't talk about setting switches and counters and using these for decision. I mean, the, the kind of instruction I foresaw in those days was a kind of learning system, a system that would learn how to deal with students, that it would have in it at any given point um, branch points, and it would keep track of itself whenever it would branch the student a particular way. What happened? Was it good or bad? And it would then, it would then kind of weight these counters in terms of decision making, and so it would become, it would adapt itself. You wouldn't have to engage in formative evaluation. It would adapt itself to become more and more and more effective, and would try the most high probability alternatives first, and then work down through the less probable ones. Uh, so the capability that I was really interested in was the technology from a learning point of view. Um, I had um, uh, relatively little interest in the, uh, the visual capability, um, that sort of thing. I, the branching was very important uh, to me, but that was in a time when our methodology was behaviorist, cognitivist, where we saw ourselves as designers controlling the learning environment for the student. And we started out first by our design controlled the environment and then let the computer take over to control the, the setting for the student. Now, in a constructivist environment, nobody really is interested in doing that kind of control. They want learner control, total learner control. And so the, the technology offers that. And what the thing that fascinates me is how much, uh, you know, we were always taught in graduate school that you have a theory which then drives research, which ends up in technology and methodology and practitioner behavior. Uh, I think we've totally abandoned that. I think that technology is our model from which we derive theory and then that will, and then comes back around for practice. And I think that the newest capabilities in computers have coincided so well with the constructivist notions of learning. I mean, they've just fed each other incredibly well. And um, so that's the direction that it's going in. And so are we making any progress? It's hard to say because people don't measure anything. And in progress, you know, you would think that there were criteria, and, and, and we do so little of that. I just know that it's, it's changing, and the, the greater emphasis on maintaining motivation. I mean, we, we really believe, again, you know, you've given a motivated learner, here's what you do with them. And now, that it's given an unmotivated learner, here, what do you do with them? Uh, which really changes your, your mindset. And uh, so getting people on task is, is sometimes more important than what the result is of having them on task. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't spend a lot of time sitting and looking at CBT and CAI, and, uh, uh, but what I see and uh, do what I do see and the people I talk to, it's not encouraging. And, the data are not encouraging in terms of research. I mean, you get these meta-analysis studies which say, yeah, computers add 10 percent or 5 percent or something like that. Um, they certainly didn't, uh, haven't changed the world because I think in certain ways we're still going through the gee whiz stage of look what we can do and which is what we were doing in the CAI Center. I mean, we didn't uh, have a mission to improve eighth grade student performance on the math test. We, our mission was, what all can you do with this wonderful machine? And so we didn't make any apologies, we just did things left and right. And I think we're still pretty much in that same kind of phase. Uh, and I think, I, I just hope that the bubble doesn't burst too soon where people start asking the return on investment question. I mean, right now, Technology's the good guy. Every the, the legislature's put money into it, and the schools are getting it, and everybody is getting it. 
But at some point, you know, that people are now starting to say, well, where are those increments in learner performance that you were talking about? There, you know, we still got eighth graders who can't add, and we get eleventh graders who can't read. I mean, what is technology going to solve all these problems? Well, I think technology can solve a lot of those problems if we get serious, get back to focusing on learning rather than motivation. Dr. Dick, you began to um, touch on this a little bit um, in your last response, but there's a, a lot of changes in, in views of learning and uh, learning environments, a lot of talk about that. And um, do, you, do you have any, any idea of if there is a, a kind of a dynamic and evolving definition of, of ISD, of, of the process, and as well as the definition of, of the concept itself, um, do you see a way in which that is evolving in response to those uh, new ideas that are, are, are emerging? Uh, yes, and, and you know, it, when they first started talking about different definitions of learning, I really had a hard time with that because learning is a relatively, you know, permanent change in behavior resulting from, uh, you know, instructional intervention or some intervention, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily instructional. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, I had a, a uh, one of those aha experiences in the mid 80s when I went over to England and attended a computer-based instruction conference over there and heard them talk about the ideal uses of computers in England. And one project they talked about was a doomsday project. And the doomsday project was one in which, um, I can't remember the details, but something about the world's coming to an end and this was in 1066. Uh, and uh, so we have to document everything about the country. And so they platted out the country and collected all this data, all this information about how many chickens and cows and how, much, how many horseshoes people made, all this sort of thing. And they put it in a database. And they said, this is the most wonderful learning resource we've ever had. This is going to revolutionize education. And, this. and I realized that the British view of learning is getting the student to maneuver around information. And, you know, and Gagné's focus and what if one of his major, major contributions is to say, you know, you can learn information and that's one of his domains, verbal information. But if you really want to make a difference, you have to deal with intellectual skills. And um, so that's you know, I, I, I've been influenced by that. I continue to to think about that. And when I see the Jasper Woodberries, and I can see that there are intellectual skills being dealt with here, and they are creating a rich context. And 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 I have in the last five to ten years really thought more and more about the learning context and the performance context, and how those shape learning outcomes. Uh, but I, th I, th I, I, I just fear the, that we get so involved with what we're creating that we lose sight of why we're creating it, and or people just have definitions of. What, I mean, the British were very, very happy just to have students, my words, muck around in this data. And you say, what did they learn? Well, everybody learned something else, you know, something different. That they, can, if they were constructivists before they knew they were constructivists. And um, that, that bothers me. On the other hand, the constructivists have, have you know, helped us look at what may be perceived as some of our weaknesses in terms of our inflexibility, our decontextualizing instruction and robbing of it of its uh, essence in which it takes place and, and the environment in which it takes place. Uh, so I, I have enjoyed the dialogue with the constructivists to a certain extent. Uh, if you enjoy, I don't know if enjoyed, stimulated maybe would be a, a better term for it uh, because it, it I think it's really good periodically to get your um, point of view kind of challenged and, and uh, uh, but 
again, it's back to the issue of flexibility versus what do you stand for. And if people are not willing to talk about the results of their intervention, if, if they want to say everybody's going to get something else, a diff separate out of it, and I don't know what it is, and I just say, oh, okay, I guess, but that's not what I do. Can I go again? Um, one of the uh, things that I think that you've probably had in your own experience, given what you said earlier, and also I think a strategy that you use in teaching is uh, what probably constructivists would term the cognitive apprenticeship uh, application. It's, it's uh, dealing with the transfer from uh, learning into the learning setting into the performance setting to some degree and I think that's what you use in your teaching. Um, it suggests to me that there might be a, an area where uh, strategies that are su suggested um, for, for teaching uh, by, cognitive, uh, by, by the constructivists or by other learning orientations are, are very well applied uh, in uh, a setting that is, is uh, managed or controlled by instructional systems uh, design and, and the methodology that is put forth by that. Good example is goal-based instruction, which Arthur Anderson and Roger Shank have promoted, which says, let's identify the goals and let's create the environment in which these goals would be performed and then have people work in those environments and learn these skills. Well, we used to call that simulation. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's a very effective task, a task, very effective instructional strategy uh, where we differ primarily is when you look at those strategies, almost all of them deal with problem solving. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, my experience says to me that you're a more effective problem solver if you have some foundational skills. Um, I saw an excellent example yesterday in a, where I was in a consulting situation where somebody had been given a problem-solving task which was well beyond them. Now the constructivist might say, that's great, that person's going to get in there and explore all the, the avenues of the data and the information and they're going to talk with people and they're going to come up with a solution. Well, this, this was essentially destroying this person because they could not succeed at the task and did not have the underlying skills to deal with the task. That's pretty dramatic and it was, it was painful to watch. But in other, the, even the Jasper Woodbury uh, series where they put kids in video scenarios where these real interesting problems are developing, the Vanderbilt people will tell you we have built in basic skills training underneath that that they're not all kids can leap in and immediately create the equations and do this and do that. And when I said, well, that's great, because that's exactly the way an, an instructional designer would view this. Here's a problem solving skill up here. What are the subordinate skills down here? What are the entry behaviors? It's great. And I think when, when you get into a dialogue with people such as those at Vanderbilt and others, there's, there's a lot of overlap and mutual uh, appreciation for what they're doing. What they have done is really highlight the top of the hierarchy mm -hmm. where because of the military background and, and uh, maybe the starting points of instructional design, we kind of started at the bottom and built up. They said, you're ignoring this up here and we're going to do exciting stuff up here and of course theirs is, is much more exciting than ours and, and fun in, in that sense. But there's no reason why a good instructional designer could not have created Jasper Woodbury. And uh, so I, I see, and I think in the Dick and Carey model, over the years there has been a blending and melding of constructivist um, ideas to the point that I think they don't destroy the integrity of the model, but they do st strengthen it. And that's a value judgment, that's a call on our part. And uh, I hope we continue to, to look at developments, what's happening, and, and to do that. But I would say that it's, it's kind of fun. Every time we do a, a, a new edition of the Dick and Carey book, the publishers always want to send it out to people and get their critique, their suggestions, what should we do in the next edition. And it's just absolutely, they might as well send out a Rorschach block because everybody says, oh, gee, well, this were mine. Now, you know, I would, you know, and uh, they want to add this, they want to add that. Well, you know, it's not a handbook on instructional design. It is a, 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 
hopefully a tailor. We try to keep it tight. It has grown. If you ever saw the first edition, it's about this big and about that thick, and now we're, you know, and we're, we're at the point now, if something goes in, something else is going out. Uh, and, but I hope we can, in answer to your question, continue to respond to new ideas that, you know, don't, that are consistent with, supportive of, and strengthen the credibility of the model. How did your movement into performance come about? Uh, Walt Wager and I wrote an article kind of that described his course on electronic performance support tools and modern performance systems analysis, and we tried to look at that. And I don't think it was an aha, aha experience. I, it really was a, a drifting towards uh, this, in this direction. I think it was driven by Gagné's insistence on intellectual skills rather than verbal information. And you don't have to go very far from intellectual skills to thinking about performance. Um, the, um, the, another dividing line is when we clearly move from a public education orientation to a business and industry. In public education, there was an inf interest on verbal information, interest in post-test performance. Business and industry, they want to see something happening out there. Now, they're not very articulate about it. They're, only, they're getting a little better about asking about it and well, how do people use skills on the job. How, and this, is, this by the way, is going, to cre is going to create some real dilemmas for us. But um, the, um, I think that seeing that people don't pay for post-test performance, that people want to see um, uh, skills used in the workplace. And, and I think being in the Motorola environment for a year and just seeing how expensive instruction is, uh, how alternative solutions, uh, well, and I guess I think working with the course has convinced me more than anything else. Uh, when we first started ta teaching the performance systems analysis course as a kind of subset of performance technology, the idea was, okay, you teams, when you're out there now, of course you're going to identify training needs. I mean, we know that. But see if you can't find a couple other things, you know, that, that, that might go along that would strengthen the solution. Well, now, I mean, I don't have to say anything like that. And almost, I mean, I've read all the projects that come in. Very few of the projects that came in this year have any training component at all. And I think they're very credible kinds of solutions. Uh, so... For me, part of the problem is, do I, as a person in this field, continue to find myself going wider and wider and wider and saying, well, I am a human performance technologist, I'm interested in all interventions, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here from the executive office and we're going to solve all of your problems, or do I, at some point, just draw a line and say, that's nice that some people are going to do that. I'm going to say my expertise is in instructional design. When there is a training solution to be developed, I will develop it. And I think that's going to be um, an individual decision that each person in our field is going to have to make. And part of it will be influenced by their personal preferences and desires and what they like to do. And part of it will be determined by the organization in which they find themselves and whether they're allowed to, to do this sort of thing. And uh, that's the dilemma I see us getting into because what we are doing is defining ourselves as organizational effectiveness people. And that is another discipline that's already staked out that territory. And in some, in most businesses and industries, there are real people with real degrees or real experience in offices who say, we do that. You don't do that. And you can say, but we learned how great it is and how wonderful it is and how what an impact we can have. That's right, and we'll do it. We'll tell you what we need. And that's, that's, that's going to be tough for a while. With this new focus on, on performance, has the uh, public education focus been abandoned? <sighs> or 
will it ever come about? I think that's one of my frustrations is I don't necessarily want to go into business. I want to stay in academe and instructional systems design isn't necessarily embraced or doesn't seem to be embraced by the academic world. I tried very hard and I could tell you a, a number of stories where I tried to, uh, where I aligned myself with faculty who had real expertise in working in the public schools because I thought that there's something I'm missing. I, I just don't, I'm going to kind of mentor myself to these are, they're going to be my mentors and help me. And this was in the 80s. Uh, we met with nothing but frustration and rebuff and that uh, the groups that we worked with were constantly putting out fires and, and just couldn't attend to what we were, you know, we were talking about, you know, long-term projects like nine months and they couldn't get to a meeting next week because something. And I personally became very discouraged and I, I looked at, at my skills, my interests and said, am I gonna make a long-term impact in public education and I very quickly came to the conclusion after all the effort I put in, no, I'm not. Because it is so politically driven that, you know, the, 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 the opportunity for technical people and technical expertise to make a difference is small. And I don't have the skills that it would take uh, to get into the system to make those kinds of changes. So the, the people who've been interested in change management within the schools and bringing about change and change process, I admire them, I applaud them. I think Dr. Branson's project was one of the best things that ever came along. And, uh, but I just knew that personally I didn't have the, what it took to hang in there. Will it ever change? I've, I've said on occasions when I really get pessimistic that I think the whole system has to collapse before it will ever respond to the kinds of technologies and methodologies that we have. That as long as it continues to bumble along the way it is, bright kids will do okay. The not so bright kids are just gonna suffer. And uh, you know, the, until the learning environment is improved, uh, I, I, just, I just get very discouraged, I guess, about it. And I, I wish that weren't my answer. The, uh, as instructional systems professionals, what can we do to improve education? Have lots of bright kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, Dan, I, you know, I just, well, one of the reasons I said, and I, I even, you know, the dean's office asked us to participate in projects, and I just said, you know, I really am sorry. I don't think I have anything to contribute. Um, I, I don't, I just, I really, truly don't know the answers. I don't know. I think Bob Branson and, and School Year 2000 were working very hard at collaboration, at getting people to set up quality systems, to look at individualized uh, performance of kids, I think they were going in the right direction. And the, the way in which the schools and the legislature and political system are run, uh, the funding didn't continue. And um, I don't know what you do to avoid that. I mean, I was being a little facetious about having bright kids, that, that helps. But uh, I know that wasn't the sense of your question. Um, I don't know. At the same time, you collaborated with Bob Singer to create textbooks. You collaborated with Bob Reeser to adapt the, the Dick and Carey model for the use by classroom instructors. Yes. And, yeah, the, the Bob Singer was uh, a book on teaching physical education, which we, was a great deal of fun and very satisfying to do because he's a fine, fine scholar. He's down to the University of Florida now. Uh, the book with Reeser uh, called Planning Effective Instruction, something like that, was an attempt to say, okay, through my physical participation, I haven't accomplished anything. Is there something that we can put on paper that others can carry the message and maybe it'll work? And what, how would, and then the intellectual uh, fun of saying, how would the model be different 
for the classroom teacher as opposed to the, the instructional designer. Kind of the person that Jim Romming, who hired us in the first place to write the book, what was the book look like if we had written it what he needed? Well, it would have looked like the Dick and Reeser book, uh, which is now Reeser and Dick. The, um, uh, uh, the interesting thing, and maybe this, is, this could be part of the answer to your question, Dan, is who are the people that are now, the few people who are using that undergraduate book? There are people who are teaching technology classes who are saying, you know, uh, to teachers, you don't just plug this thing in and put up some, some neat stuff on the screen. It's got to be part of a systematically planned instructional approach. And they're buying the Reeser and Dick book and saying, hey, this is what the planning process is all about. Embed your technology in a, in a strategy. And that may be the foot in the door uh, for systematic planning and making a difference. Um, you know, I wouldn't bet the ranch on it, but it's, it is it's it is one, thanks for, <laughs> for cueing me on that. that is, that is, that's been uh, an attempt to do so, yeah. And that's the way we've gotten people into the schools. I mean, there's no, there's no uh, position in DOE called instructional designer in the public schools. We've gotten in through project managers and through uh, uh, educational technology computer people who have gone in to assist librarians as they change over to, to media specialists. And that, uh, but still, the emphasis is on getting something up and running, and credible. You know, there's something that's other than playing games, and not so much learning outcomes. Dr. Dick, uh, we've talked uh, quite a bit today about technology and how technology, of course, has improved over the years. And uh, you've mentioned how it's impacted our field. Uh, could you kind of explain in a little bit more detail how technology has affected? Uh, what we might call the basic competencies that are expected of ISD professionals today. And maybe even more generally, uh, what are those competencies that are expected today and how do you envision them as adapting and changing over time? Okay, there, there's uh, multiple layers to answer to your question. One is competencies as defined by national and international groups, AECT, IPSTPI, like that, where they're trying to, to capture the generic designer. That's, there's that level. Then there's the institutional level. How, how does Florida State deal with that versus Indiana versus Syracuse versus San Diego? And then there's the individual level, how you deal with it. The, at the institutional level, you get major differences. And this goes back to our historical foundations. Uh, Indiana grew out of an audiovisual department. There was always an emphasis on video production, photography, uh, audio, uh, tape slide, transparency, the, the actual process of, of uh, producing f with the media. Uh, in their early history, they had relatively little emphasis on theory, very little on design, very little on evaluation. Most of their graduates went to uh, become directors of media centers. And they were very competent at um, reviewing and assessing new technologies, um, demonstrating how they could be used but not very successful in getting anybody to use them. And I mean, they would readily admit that. Uh, we, on the other hand, uh, we, we for 10 years, we didn't have anybody who could even use an overhead projector. And uh, we didn't really worry about that because the technology was not a major component of what we did. Instructional design development was not about computers or video, and we got into we had, we had some problems because we had some contracts with Latin American countries where they would come to Florida State to study educational technology, and that translated to video technology. 
and they would come and we didn't even have a video camera you know and they'd say what hey and we'd say no no we want to teach you about how to write objectives and they said whoa <laughs> that's not why we came so uh, you get the institutional differences uh, we have never emphasized the skills of of actually being t able to produce or operate the equipment wrecking and but not in the sense of demeaning it but saying there's only so many things you can do these other things are our forte analysis is our forte theory is our forte data collection being empirical people is our forte not video production that you know that was a nice comfortable place to be again until these confounded computers came along and that uh, you know it was easy for a while just to say we'll put the computers in that same category as we had the you know the motion picture camera and everything else they're just one more thing that well you know we didn't really realize how much it was going to become a, a productivity tool and uh, so much a part of our lives and so I just don't, you can't make those statements anymore. And I think as, our, as far as our field is concerned, it is expected that you have basic competencies in the, you know, in the basic applications uh, of tools. And more and more, I um, expect you at le least know one authoring language and, and, and that you can put something up on the web. And whether that's right or wrong, I, I'm not judging it, but I think it's, it's an expectation that people now have. Um, and I think we would hope as faculty, I think, that you would know about those things, but not necessarily earn a living doing them. But you could say, that's a great idea for creating a web course because you can take advantage of these features, but now remember you can't do this right now. And you would know the features and know what to tell somebody who's actually sitting there pumping stuff in. And that's kind of been our approach continually, except for this more recent uh, uh, using computers as a personal productivity tool, has been to gain enough knowledge that you can communicate with the people who have the technology expertise, to tell them what you want, to be able to judge what they give you, and, uh, and to use it effectively, make good decisions about it. Uh, at the you know at the national level, those st those standards are are fairly general, uh, but I think back down at the individual level, then you have to decide for yourself how much you want to do. And we you know pe people come into our program or come in as prospective students, and they say, we would um, you know how much technology am I going to get? And you're kind of in the dilemma here an ethical dilemma because you don't want to lose this student but you don't want to mislead them and so what I try to do is say these are the courses we have we have reasonably current technology but it's not going to be the latest uh, it'll probably become obsolete while you're here maybe we'll get some more uh, but there are more important things than uh, you know the size of the monitor or the size of the RAM or something else and here and then launch into something else that you know t to try to t distract them to to the uh, other other things they have because all and it's not Florida State it's all the all the academic programs are faced with exactly the same issue even Indiana has this beautiful building and they were endowed with all these uh, computers and everything the last time I was there, I said, they showed me this beautiful room full of computers. And I said, now, when these become obsolete, uh, who, who, how are you going to purchase the next set? We don't know. The, you know, the, 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 the universities don't have a capitalization plan in place that for a regular rotation. of they, they understand it with engineering or the medical school, but not education, that you have to rotate the equipment. Yeah, this question is kind of similar to the one that Ray had but it uh, more pertains towards um, practitioners in the field of ISD and HPT, particularly in the business setting. Um, what would you say, as a practitioner in the business setting, would be the core set of competencies that I guess um, a practitioner must possess to, I guess, excel in that field, make a difference, and really have an impact? And uh, get back into the predictive nature of the question, what, 
with your ideas of how you see the field evolving, how do you see those competencies changing? In other words, as a student, where should I direct my efforts? When we first uh, had master students going into the field, and we got accustomed to the idea that they were going to go to Motorola, they're going to go to Arthur Anderson, they're going to. What I thought, in my view, was that these are people who have a degree in instructional design, which is like saying you are a doctor, or you're a lawyer, or you're a minister, you're an instructional designer. Now, you're going to go to Motorola and be an instructional designer. And you'll go to ISPI and you'll read the literature and you will grow and prosper as an instructional designer. What I learned at Motorola was that is a basic fallacy. Because when you walk in the door, you're not an instructional designer, you're Motorola. And today, we're going to have you design instruction. But tomorrow you may be a trainer, and the next day you may be a facilitator, and the next day you may be out, send you to China to do an analysis. And, and who knows, you may, become, you may go over to the HR department, you may. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that the skills, we, we hope you have the best set of skills that we can provide to go into the work environment. How the, but, but in one sense, the technical skills will probably invariably change in what you need because of the field will change and your job will change and where they put you and what you're called on to do. So if you ask me what the core competencies are, and I, we get hit with this over and over again when you, and you see this on the, the listserv when people are talking about positions, they may say, well, we want somebody who can do a front-end analysis and somebody who you knows HTML and somebody... But then they'll say, but fundamentally, interpersonal skills, organized, on time, you know, delivers on time, uh, flexible, not dogmatic. It's, it, those are the skills that are endearing to an organization. Those are the skills that um, help you get promoted, open new vistas to you. And you can have all the technical skills in the world, and if you aren't, you know, able to, to call on that, the charm school subset, uh, you probably are going to struggle. And uh, we've seen students who uh, go out who are quite technically sound, but for one reason or another don't have those skills. And, and you know, that's the interesting question. What's our responsibility in that regard? Uh, and that, that's hard to answer, but that's my answer to your question. And as the f field changes, are those core skills going to change? I, doubt, I think they're probably going to become more important uh, because the corporations have a view that they can always hire technical expertise. They're looking for the people people who can manage and, and um, take ideas, run with them, get something done with as little pain and strain as possible. But uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, tell me in six months whether you're uh, still an instructional designer first or whether you're, you're a corporate person. And uh, you see that, especially when they start giving you stock options in the company. <laughs> they, you become more and more they, the, the old golden handcuffs of it. Uh, that, was, that was a real surprise to me. It was an eye-opener to me. The, uh, what, uh, what advice do you have for graduate students? Well, in light of some of the things we've been saying here, I think that the, 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 this whole area of flexibility, because we are, some who know our field see us as relatively rigid and inflexible kinds of people who kind of know it all, so here's the way you do it. And I think that, that we have to work hard to not be that way, uh, that we do have to be flexible with our use of knowledge and, and, and open to looking at other ways of doing things. I think that's what's always interesting when you go into an, a new organization is to see how they do things. And everyone's trying to say, boy, is that a good idea? And then other times you say, that is the stupidest <laughs> way I've ever, you know, how can they do that? 
advice that my friend Duncan gave me many, many years ago was, Walter, and this is when I'm tearing my hair out over some stupid you know, thing that Florida State was doing. He said, every institution has its craziness. Just learn what it is and learn to deal with it. Don't try to change it. And so I've, I've always thought about that whenever, particularly you go into a new organization and you see some of the you know, really absurd things they do, at least from your point of view, that have probably been procedures and methodologies that have grown up over years and, and it just kind of got to be that way and you know, that's the way we do it. And you just say, well, that's part of their craziness. You know, let it be, let's get on with something where you can be productive. So there is the willingness to be flexible and at the same time really deciding what is important to you, you know, whether it's the amount of travel you'll do, whether it's the kinds of projects you'll work on. Uh, we have a student right now who's looking for jobs who has said, I will not work for any company that sells alcohol or tobacco. And that's, I mean, that's his values and that's fine. And uh, that may not be somebody else's. But knowing where you stand, what you'll do, what you don't want to do, what you want to accomplish, uh, and then kind of sticking by those. And, you know, it's, uh, I guess, kind of knowing what you can change and trying to work on it, what you can't change, living with it, uh, as long as it's within your realm of ethics. In 1980, uh, D. Andrews and Ludie Goodson published an article in which they cast the net and pulled up 40 published ISD models and compared them. And since that time, uh, in every branch of the military developed its own systems approach to training, and an awful lot of corporations decided that their needs were unique and they had to have their own models or their own methods, their proprietary methods for ISD. Um, since you're best known for an ISD model, what is your perspective on what really drives or justifies the creation of new models? How, how do we know when we need a new model? And do you think that we're converging or diverging with our models? Well, number number of reactions. One is, um, Clearly, there are many, many, many models. I think that the, uh, the reason for that is that in any given organization, in order to establish credibility for what you're trying to do, you try and capture it on paper. And that one way you can do it is to say, oh, we use the Dick and Carey model, or we use the Kemp model. But that doesn't show a whole lot of creativity and nor does it reflect a lot of adaptation to the local environment. So I think that the reason there are so many models is that uh, people who have learned about instructional design have tried to tailor it to their environment. And I think when you see the tailoring, what goes on is uh, maybe where we have one box, they'll make it three boxes because that's really important in their organization. So they break it out into more steps. Um, or they may cluster. In, in most cases, they make more boxes uh, to make it look uh, more important. And we know very well that in some organizations which are engineering driven, the people in instructional technology create models so they'll look like the engineers. They'll say, you engineers, you have your models. Here, we got our models. And so uh, the, the, the issue is not so much that we have so many models, but the question is, do they get used? And how valuable are they? Do they just get created and then people say, that's nice, we'll laminate those, put them on the wall, and then everybody just goes about their business. And that's what some researchers have tried to look at for a long time, and mostly the conclusions are everybody does things differently and they don't follow the models. And, uh, that sort of thing. The, um, are we converging or diverging? The models, frankly, that I have a really hard time with are the circular ones. You know, when we got into the 80s and, and 90s, I guess, where the people who rebelled against the linear boxes 
said, I'll create a model, but it'll, ju it'll just be this. They always have fluffy clouds around, and you know, and you know, and there's no start, there's no stop, there's just, uh, you know, and I, uh, uh, I think that's whether well, that's diverging, I, it's going in the wrong direction. Um, I think the interesting challenge, really, for models right now are the people who are trying to deal with models uh, for computer implemented instruction. And how do those models differ from just the generic ID model? I mean, we got a little box that says instructional strategy and develop instruction. Um, that strategy box, when you have a uh, a computer of the sort you were mentioning earlier opens up so more, many more opportunities. We used to talk about media selection as, well, you either take video or you have print or, you know, well now that's that question. You can have any format you want. You can select and change within seconds. Uh, so you can select all media. Uh, and I think the challenge is that the technology is so far ahead of our theory that the con why not the constructivism? Why not just say, well, just put it out there and see what happens? So a, a, a profitable research line may be to say, let's look at some constructivist stuff that works and uh, you know, kind of, uh, what do you call it, retro-engineering or de-engineering, whatever. Take it apart and try and figure out what the rules and principles are of some that really works and some that's really crummy but you have to decide what works means. And that now we're back to, well, we don't evaluate, so, you know. If I may follow up. Uh, back in the 80s, Hazeltine and uh, later Ford Aerospace, later Laurel, uh, with their ticket system, tried to develop an automated designer. Yes. And much more recently, I think it's Allen Communications has Designer's Edge and Dave Merrill in Utah with his ID2 group has been trying to pursue that as, as well. Uh, what's your gut feel on automatic ISD? Well, I try to learn from the past. And if I didn't, I'd say they don't have a snowball's chance. But mm -hmm. having said that before, uh, uh, it's such an appealing notion to be able to take artificial intelligence and capture it so that we could do this, so that it could be a significant help. All the models that I've looked at are management systems, which after you do something, captures it for you, or it reminds you that you should do something, and it captures and documents what you've done and doesn't really design. Dave Merrill is the closest to that with his ID2 system. I think Dave Merrill is one of the brightest people we have in our field or most any other field. And I think that all we can do at this point is watch people like that and see what they can do. I, mean, I would just have to assume, sure, that someday it's going to happen. And it may not be very good. It may be something that comes out 80% is okay and then we have to doctor up the other 20%. Uh, I don't know that it's going to be a print-based format or whether it's actually going to create screen displays. You know, that, that, and that's kind of how Merrill's work, you know, put in pictures of this, this, and this, and tell me the basic concepts, and I'll do this, and I'll put a picture here, and I'll put a uh, diagram there, and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if, you're video, if you were viewing this tape 20 years from now, You'd say, boy, uh, you know, couldn't they see the XYZ system coming? You know, it was so, so clear. It was right there. Um, and uh, I, I would think it would. I think it's going to be for the very fundamental lower level aspects of, of learning, of the learning hierarchy. And we're still going to be challenged with uh, the higher order stuff. But if we want to teach discriminations, I think we can figure out how to have a computer generate some instruction to teach discriminations. And I think that'll just continue to grow. What uh, what would you've talked a little bit about, uh, what would you say are some of your predictions for the future of our field? Um, I, 
I don't, I don't necessarily have predictions. I see um, some, some splitting coming. I don't know if, they're pred if it's a prediction or it's just a trend that, um, as we talked about earlier, this public education versus business industry, those two contexts, I see them as so different. I see the AECT and the ISPI. Um, the motivations of the people that are in the two fields in terms of what they're trying to accomplish and what they're trying to do. The uh, relative, from our view, our field's point of view, emphasis of technology in the public sector. In the business and industry, it's much more on analysis, uh, some on web-based, just to be with one of the crowd, I need to get some web-based stuff up, but more interest in fundamental design, analysis, evaluation. Uh, I could see essentially the field splitting, it, whatever our field is, but I can see a split coming. You see it in people who tend to identify with one side or the other. And back to your question, uh, Rita, that the dilemma that the academic programs find themselves in uh, is that we, almost everyone in the country is, is in a college of education whose major mission is to prepare teachers. And so when the dean looks at a department, he or she normally just says, what have you done for me lately to prepare teachers? And now they're looking at our programs and saying, you people are really what we need. We need more people to help with the technology for teachers. And so when we say, well, we'd like to have a new position, Dean, he says, that's great. Here is that position. Now go find somebody who will work in teacher education to help teachers integrate technology into the classroom. And we say, well, we have three of those. What we really need is somebody with business and industry experience who can help build liaison with the industry, bring in some funds, build bridge, do this, that. Oh, we don't do that. You know, may, you know do that on, you know, after 5 o'clock. And so we have people saying, well, why aren't you in the business school? Um, I was in a meeting a couple other days, a couple days ago, where the, the assumption was that we were in a business school. Oh, you're not in the business school. No. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that this is, is going to, we've been able to live together happily and kind of uh, mesh interests, but when you look at our faculty, you do find a separation uh, there. Some people overlap a little bit. I tried for a while and I couldn't. But, um, so that's one of the trends. The one that I am most interested in is distance learning in terms of it is everything we dreamed of in the 60s in terms of creating an individualized learning environment which we saw as the optimal one uh, because it was self-paced and tailored to the individual. The technology is so far beyond our wildest imagination. Uh, it is politically attractive and financially attractive there is a genuine need in many environments for distance learning, and nobody likes it. And so I think that is really fascinating. I mean, the only people who ever like it are the ones who say, I could never have had this course. I could not have driven 90 miles a night, you know, once a week to, from Valdosta to take this course. I can take this course. I've grown from it. I can apply it to my certificate, or I can use it on the job. And I really appreciate it. They liked the results. They didn't like the course. Uh, so you know, what has really impressed me, uh, more so than I ever realized before, is the need people have to get together. And you know, it, it's like when you talk to me about doing this session. What did I say? I said, I want some people there. I want, I want to interact. I want to see faces. I want to uh, respond. I don't want a, a voice in the ceiling saying, now talk about you know uh, it's and it's uh, uh, maybe I'm kind of a late learner, but uh, it, I think that that's a real interesting tension and dilemma that we have as to how to build in the best of both worlds into those distance learning systems. And I think the technology is going to come along to help us do that more and more. And and kind of the virtual classroom. And I I think I'm in there with all these other people. And I'm you know. 
but I think that's that's going to that's one of the most interesting things we have have going for us. And I think the whole issue is of will will instructional design as we know it survive? I mean, I did a paper about will Dick and Carey models survive the decade, and uh, I'm very concerned about uh, uh, if we took all our doctoral students right now and maybe those who graduated in the last three years and said, what is your major area of interest and expertise when you go out there and you start knocking on doors? What's something you want to follow for the next 10 years? I'll bet we couldn't get two people to say instructional design. And I don't think that's going to be an emphasis. I think that there's going to be a problem getting really qualified people to teach instructional design. Uh, that, that, that's that's an issue when you get beyond the major universities and you get instructional design being taught in two-person programs and something like that. How, you know, there's competency and there's interest. And I think there's so many other bells and whistles out there that are, that are more exciting than the, uh, the fundamental instructional design process that I, I hope we don't lose it completely because there are places where yeah, we teach instructional design. Oh, we use your textbook. I said, well, tell me about the course. Well, what we do is it's really about authoring systems. And uh, we tell, you know, it's, it's back to the how you prepare teachers to use technology in the classroom. But they'll teach, a, they'll teach, teach an instructional design course, a, an authoring system course, and maybe even evaluation all in one. And of course, design gets two weeks on the front, and evaluation might get one at the end, and everything else is on getting something up there that's tangible, that flows, and you don't go down dead alleys, uh, those sorts of things. So it, the, the whole future of instructional design, and maybe it doesn't deserve to continue. I mean, maybe we really need to you know, have a, a um, um, paradigm shift, as we say. And uh, go and uh, uh, do some other approaches, uh, and that's that'd be fine. I think I think it's served us well. I think it's gotten us from 1960 to 2000, and uh, with the other challenges and changes in the field, maybe we do need to move on to other models. Knowing uh, knowing what you know, uh, knowing know what you know now, what would you do differently uh, if you were going to do it all over? I asked Bob Gagné that question one time, and if you interview him, you might ask him to say, see if it, the test retest reliability here. <laughs> uh, he told me if he, he had his career to do over, he would have spent more time looking at transfer training. That that's the, that's the fundamental issue we're dealing with. Is, and, and it gets back to the question of performance, moving from learning to performance, is how do you get from something up here to something happening out there? And what are the parameters of that? Uh, and I think as we moved from the public school transfer of training question to business and industry, the issues just become incredibly complex. And that's why in our latest Dick and Care, we talk about context analysis. Because in public education, context you know, really is maybe the word problems change or something. But in business and industry, it's you've got a manager who is has these biases and you don't have these resources and you know you'll be punished if you use these skills and looking at that that sort of thing so uh, uh, what would I do differently uh, I'll tell you, well I used I, I used to confront this issue ra rather frequently when I would look at my uh, sabbatical faculty are eligible to take a semester off at full pay or a year at half pay after they've spent seven years on the faculty. And so I had done that at quite a young age. And so I started thinking about, well, now where would I like to go? What would I like to do? And I kept saying, but where else can I go? They got Bob Gagne in the next office and Lex Briggs in that one and Bob Morgan's down the hall and along with Bob Branson. Right? And uh, I never, I never went anywhere for a long time. I just stayed here and focused on our problems and issues and opportunities. The best, one of the best decisions I ever made was to go to Motorola. 
because it really opened my eyes. And I think it's the um, opportunity to to go into another environment and to see, particularly one that was so dramatically different. I mean, it was a singer that I worked for in the in the '60s was was um, you know it couldn't compare with Motorola, and that really really helped uh, my understanding. Another. Uh, I guess I'm coming out with good decisions. I don't know that I do anything differently. The, probably another of the best decisions I ever made was in 1973 when I decided to leave the dean's office. I was, I was an assistant dean for four years. I came to that point in my career where either I had to become a dean and then a vice president, a president, go that route, or go back into the technical end. And I looked at what was happening and uh, you know, in the 70s with the oil embargo and the money and the budget cutting and uh, the bloodletting that was going on, I thought being an administrator will not be fun. Gagne was really right when he said stay away <laughs> from that. And so uh, that was a, well, career-shaping decision to abandon administration, go back into being a professor. What would I do differently? I, I can think of things I would wished I had done differently, but they require different skills and knowledge. I mean, I, I wish that I were as uh, suave as Bob Morgan and could sashay around the world and, and <laughs> you know, and uh, have all the wonderful uh, experiences he had, but the, you know, that's not me. And uh, so, uh, I wish I could have run faster. I never, <laughs> never got, <laughs> was able to do that any better. <laughs> But uh, I, I, I have absolutely no regrets. Maybe, maybe, whoops. Maybe I should, but I don't. If uh, you were going to be snowbound for a week with your lifetime professional library of all the things you've already read, what would you pull off the shelf and reread just for the sheer joy of it? Start with Skinner's Walden too, because that really motivated me uh, initially to be attracted to the field of human behavior. Um, I think I would I, I would, would probably, probably read uh, Gagne's Conditions of Learning again now, 20 years later, to see. Uh, uh, revisit it and, and, and see the wisdom or lack thereof maybe at, at this point, just see how it holds up historically. Uh, interestingly, I would like to read Peter Senge again, The Learning Organization. I think it is so thick with ideas that it really deserves a rereading. Um, I would, it might be self-serving to say the Dick and Carrie book, but I get to read that every five years anyway <laughs> when we revise it. Um, I have to think some more. You know, you know, you don't read a measurement book over again or a statistics book over again. Um, I don't know, I can think of other books, but in terms of professional ones, um, you know, I, I guess I'm not doing for, I, 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 I like to buy, I read new books, the ones that have just been published, <laughs> you know, rather than going back and rereading the other ones. So it, you made a comment before that I felt was uh, really interesting. You said that um, technology is so far ahead of theory um, was there ever a time where that wasn't the case? And also, in terms of the future, do you see that gap closing or expanding, and what would contribute to? I think back in the 50s and 60s, um, our idea of technology was a Skinner box, and um, uh, video cameras were not driving our concept of the learning process. Rats were. I mean, that's what <laughs> we... Uh, but, uh, uh, the, um, but oh, I, I think that the technology is going to continue to out, 
strip our theory and so we will use it. We will simply use the technology. That the theoreticians are really the technologists behind the technology. The, 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 the scientists and the programmers who create capabilities that we then say, oh, we can do that. We can, we can get automation going this way and this way at the same time. Or we can get 3D now on our screen. Um, we can, you know, we can do two languages simultaneously, whatever. Uh, that uh, those technological capabilities will get used and then some really bright people like Dave Merrill will come up with a, with a theory as to what's happening. And the other thing is that the, the DNA research, I mean, I think we're all, we're really having just a lot of fun right now, but, you know, because we don't know what's going on with the chemistry and the DNA. And I think that, you know, in 100 years from now, all this will be kind of irrelevant because we will know how to manipulate the DNA structures on people and uh, I think the learning process will be extremely different from what it is now. I, I don't know if it's a Brave New Worlds or what, you know, what it's going to be, whether they'll put a chip in the back of your neck or whatever, but uh, I, I think that, that that knowledge is going to fall, I mean, it's going to make our descriptions of the learning process look like the dark ages. You know, the people, you, you, know, you, re you know, they do something and then you tell them that's good and they do it again. Well, we know what's going back there. The acetylcholine is firing off this neuron, which is doing this, which is, you know, and that's, if you wanted to learn something, you just, you know, uh, you know that's kind of gruesome. Uh, but I, th I think long, long term, I mean, that's, that's where we'll be. We'll be web that, that DNA mapping is going to tell us so much. A hundred years from now, how would you like historians to, what contributions, what would you like them to remember about your work? I, I would doubt that anybody would ever <laughs> knew that I was on this face of this earth. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have an answer for that question. Um, help all the ISD students who have to explain to their mother what it is that they do. <laughs> How, you know, what does your mother think you do? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, it was it was extremely interesting in that time period where I was working, particularly working with the computers in the '60s. Well. You know, the, people didn't know what computers were, and then instructional design, and I would go into a long explanation, and my mother would just nod her head, hmm, 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 I think this time she's got it. And I get all done, and she says, I still don't know, I don't understand. And that was why she was so pleased when I went into administration, because she knew <laughs> what a dean did. And I said, oh, my son's going to, you know, he's an assistant dean, he can do that. Uh, I th I think you try to work by analogy. I think you try and, and take the person's, the job that they're in, uh, the, the, the profession or their prior experience outside of the university or public education, and, uh, or even so simple as to say, uh, uh, you know, when you go into McDonald's, somebody takes your order, they use that well, it used to be a cash register, and they push those buttons, and the order comes out, and you get your food. How'd they learn how to do that? Well, I don't know somebody showed them. Well, we design training to make sure that they can do it. I mean, try to do it as as simple uh, and and wherever wherever the person is that you're talking to. I didn't work with my mother. Maybe work with your mother. I don't know. <laughs> well, Doctor Dick, we just. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your wisdom here. And it was fun. Process. And I know that people, um, numerous people across the country and the world are going to enjoy this session too. So we appreciate your time. Well, thanks for asking me. It was a real pleasure.